My dear brothers and respected elders, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made or made us from amongst the best of Ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us from the best of Ummah, the best of nations, and that is from the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we should sometimes sit and reflect that this is, wallah, such a big blessing, honestly. You can only really truly appreciate this blessing if we were void of Iman. Only then we will really truly appreciate this ni'mat which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave is because when a person wants to go in the akhirah, when they see that there's nothing in store for them, that's when it will hit the people the most. And people will wish that had they only recognized who Allah wa ta'ala was in the dunya. Of course, we are sinful and we accept our sins. We accept that we're not perfect. We accept we're far from perfect. And we make ruju to Allah in humility and humbleness. Ya Allah, you know, we're... Ham gande hain, lekin phir bhi tere bande hain. <laughs> they say in Urdu, it's nicer. We're filthy and dirty, but Allah, we're still your slaves. Have mercy on us. And this is how we approach. You know, this is how we think about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, when he was dying and passing away, he was pondering and thinking over his life. And he was mentioning in poetry form about how he felt. And then he mentioned this one last poem, which translates to something so subhanAllah amazing. He said that when I, look at, when I look at the sins which I have done, I look at them as being very, very big. But when I compare those sins to your mercy, then I realize, okay, I'm not in, it, I'm not in the problem. You know, when I join them to your, when I join my sins and compare it to your forgiveness, I realize that there's no problem for me at all because you can forgive. And this was an imam of his time. Us, unfortunately, we're very far from that. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, where he passed away, his daughter, she came to him. And at the time, obviously, she was very really moved with emotion and she was really upset that he was passing away. Naturally, it's your father and he's an imam, very pious person. So then she says to him, he says, well, don't worry, just be, rest assured, it's okay, alhamdulillah. I'm in the best place I can be. Obviously, every mu'min and every believer's heart is to pass away in Makkah and Medina, fi sabilillah, in the path of Allah, doing some effort of deen. However, other than that, obviously, he's in his home. He said, I'm in the best place otherwise. So she said, how can you be so certain? He said, Alhamdulillah, the room you're sitting in now, I've read the Qur'an minimum 4,000 times. 4,000. Now that's easier said than actually done. Now, Uzzullah, let's start from Ramadan. We're on the 12th fast, right? How many of us have just read 12 juz? <laughs> let's not go further. How many of us have done 12 juz? So this is where the litmus test is. It's easy to say, Masha, this many Qur'ans, but realistically, we're very, very... May Allah make us from amongst... Having some ihsas and fikr for the akhirah. You know, Sahaba, if we would have, Sahaba would have seen a day where people would be working 12 hour shifts a day for dunya, they'd be like, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. How can, for something so temporary, you're giving half your life away? How? So for us, it seems, how can someone pray tahajjud all night? How can someone do dhikrullah all night? How can someone read Quran all night? How? How is it possible someone read Quran for 10 hours? They would think the other way. How is it possible for someone to do... Like, I'll give you an example. There's one Sahabi, radiallahu anhu, and uh, he heard a fadila from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, iqala. Iqala is basically where if somebody buys something from you and then they want to send it back, the masala is, is that you take it back so long as there's no default, uh, no, no fault in it. So I've got this book, I'm selling books, five pounds, ten pounds. Someone looked at it and said, I'm sorry, I, I, I bought the wrong book, I don't really want this one, I need another one. I take that book back. So long as it's not broken or ripped or torn or, or defaced in any way is not decrease his value i take that back it's called iqala in arabic so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned whoever does iqala for a muslim allah will do iqala for him on the day of qiyamah meaning allah will reduce your sins on the day of qiyamah so this sahabi set up business he set up business he's waiting 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 months go by months go by someone comes and says i want to bring this item back he says alhamdulillah here's your item back shot shot and finish the shop, finish business. So someone said, why are you doing that? He goes, I was doing it for the iqala, for the thawab. I wasn't doing it for the dunya. I was doing it so I can get this reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all I was interested in. Like, Unki, look at their thoughts. <laughs> look at their thinking. All their thinking, they were... That's why it mentions, لا تكن من أبناء الدنيا كونوا من أبناء الآخرة This is just a saying, don't be slaves of, and sons of this dunya, rather be sons and slaves of the akhira. That's the ideal of a Muslim. Having said that, of course, we have to live in the dunya. We're not like malang. We're not like, just sit there and 
you know, think that us, Allah's going to throw rizq from the skies. We're in a very practical zamana and we have to live according to the times and we appreciate that. What it means is, just as how a boat travels on water, it does not allow the water to come in. Travel in the dunya, but don't allow dunya to take over and corrupt your heart. So keeping this in mind, obviously now, uh, that was something which we have to keep in mind and remind ourselves time and time again. And this is beautiful in the month of Ramadan for us to bring ourselves our attention to this again and again. But something which I wanted to point out, which perhaps some of us may not be aware of, and it pains me to mention that such topics. But as we are aware that over the Easter weekend, something very, very atrocious happened, unfortunately. There was an attack in Sri Lanka, and most of us have heard of it, and obviously it was mentioned. And, and over 300 people had died in, 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 in an attack against on Christian churches on Easter Sunday, which is supposed to be what I regard as one of the most sacred days within the Christian calendar. So, excuse me. So what happened is, right, is that unfortunately many people lost their lives. Okay, it, you know, it, it, the target is being made up Muslims. That there is this so-called extreme apparent jama'ah, this group of people who coordinated these very sophisticated attacks. Wallahu alam how they pulled, if, I mean, I, I, I'm skeptical because to pull off something like that on such a scale with the small number of people you have, Either your country's security is absolutely rubbish and your intelligence is absolutely pants. In that case, I'm sorry, but then, you know, that, that reflects on the country. But I don't believe that to be the case. I think there's something more sinister. Like I said, I can't prove it. It just doesn't add up. The numbers don't add up. How can something so sophisticated be orchestrated by these apparent so-called few individuals? Allah knows best. But nevertheless, having said that, the fingers are being pointed towards Muslims. And they're saying that it's Muslim extremists that have perpetrated this particular attack and then ISIS gets involved and we you know they don't claim, they didn't claim responsibility but that is what some organizations want if we just say yeah we did it it creates fear then people fear that organization so you capitalize on other people's juram and crimes mm-hmm. put that aside let's let's not even talk about because I can't prove or disprove it's out there and people are saying it's Muslims okay okay fair enough let's just assume it is Muslims our issue is this now is that obviously not everyone is the same we do have factions amongst Muslims we, have, we do have people that perhaps are a bit more overzealous and extreme in our communities. I mean, I, I can tell you things even amongst ourselves. Like, for example, all you have to do is just change where you tie your hands and people assume you to be like out of the fold of Islam. I know that may sound a bit ridiculous, but, and it is a bit, bit, a bit comical. But we basically trivialize, uh, we make big things out of such small issues. Fiqh is a basically a thing which is, like someone asked me, if someone, for example, now uh, does raf al yadain and you know they're doing masa on socks, are they from the Ahlul Sunnah? I said, sorry, say that again. Are they from the Ahlul Sunnah? So you're thinking that maybe they're out of Islam because they make masa on cotton socks. I said, brother, this is a fiqh issue. Fiqh, please. This has nothing to do with the aqeedah, nothing to do with beliefs. They're not claiming to be two gods, Nauzubillah, or another prophet, or Quran's not complete. That's not the case, okay? So let's not get into these. They're called peripheral, furu'. Branch ikhtilaf, okay? So we don't get into this as Muslims. It's important to discuss it as an academic level, but we've made this the, the you know, the, we've made this division amongst us, uh, ourselves, okay? So unfortunately, this is really, really common. And as a result, sometimes, Nauzubillah, we've broken up into small, small factions. And, and that's what we have. You walk into one masjid, Ahle Sunnah Dilban, Ahle Sunnah Brilvi, Ahle Hadith. And you know, all these names and funny titles, the truth of the matter is, these attacks that are happening in Sri Lanka now, they're not saying, They're going there, bruv, and they're attacking Muslims, and they're saying, right, destroying businesses, this is happening in the northwestern part of Sri Lanka, Masajid are being attacked, homes are being attacked, Muslim businesses are being raised to the ground and destroyed. One person, Astaghfirullah, he got slashed up and killed, you know, brutally quite killed, you know, in, in, in the northwest, and then the west side. This is not happening in the name of Sunni, Brilvi, Shia. And this, they're saying, bro, these are Muslims that did this. Khalas. They're not looking at, there are different people that exist within a faith. And no Muslim, I, I have not any, met any Muslim that has said that it was a good thing. Na'uzubillah. We value life. We value life. Can you remember I mentioned about the maqasid and purpose of Sharia? One of them was what? The valuing of human life. That's one of the maqasid and purpose of the sharia. That is why it's very strict on taking drugs and so on, because we value human life. So to say that Nauzubillah Muslims agree to such a thing is absolutely preposterous of a claim. But nevertheless, the ahwal are falling on these Muslim brothers and sisters. 
Now, the sad reality is, is that what is said, apparent news reports are, are, are saying that it's possible that it's the Buddhist majority which are unfortunately instigating issues. Now, there's a group in Sri Lanka known as the BBS, right, which is the, translated as the Boro Balasina. The Buddhist power force, okay? Now, these are the guys who have a real issue with Muslims. And even a couple of years ago, last year or the year before, there was attacks in Aludgama, Kandy area. And unfortunately, Muslims were at the receiving end of a lot of zulm and injustice. And some of the claims are actually quite really pathetic. I mean, some things that in a, in a democratic society which you claim to live in, everyone has the right to practice religion. But they say, oh, Muslims are becoming insular and they kind of separate themselves. You know, and, and claims like that. And as a result, then apparently it gives people the right to go and launch an attack. As Muslims, like I said, look, what do, what do we do? And when these ahwal are taking place in the dunya, what do we do? That's the question. First and foremost, understand one thing. Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu anhu, he said in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man lam, man lam bi amri minhum. Whosoever from amongst my ummah, he's talking to us, does not concern themselves with the affairs of the ummah, then they are not from them. They're not from them if they don't concern themselves with the affairs of the ummah. Al-Muslim kal jasad al-wahid. Prophet ﷺ mentioned the Muslim ummah is like one body. Bangladesh ahwal happen, this is our problem. Sri Lanka ahwal happen, it's our problem. Nigeria ahwal happen, it's our problem. Pakistan ahwal happen, our problem. Ethiopia ahwal happen, our problem. Morocco ahwal happen, it's our problem. Saudi ahwal happen, it's our problem. Wherever Muslims are, it's our problem as in terms of being Muslim brothers. However, if ahwal and conditions and afflictions and atrocities befall even non-Muslims, we feel for that as well. But it's only natural. It's only natural that if you have two people who are ill, one is someone you don't know, one is your father, one is your brother, one is your uncle, one is your relative. It's human emotion. You're going to feel more compassion there. So we're not discarding everybody else, but there is a sentiment that we do have that connection with our Muslim brothers and sisters more. It's only human nature. But we should have that fikr. What is happening abroad? What is happening in the Ummah? Where are the ahwal taking place? Brother Qassam, there's so much. Uqsim Billah, there's too many masail. But we need to keep ourselves afloat with what is happening in the Ummah. Where are the ahwal happening? What can we do in response? This is the question. Us living in UK, us living abroad, or diaspora Muslim, diaspora Muslim, what do they do? What do they do? How do they respond? Well, obviously, number first and foremost is, is to create some form of awareness in the small capacity which we can, in a peaceful way, not, in a, not in, a, in, a, in a way which contradicts the laws, but to raise our voices in a way to, to say, hold on a second, those perpetrators of crimes, take them to justice. Exert the full pressure of the law on them. We're full all for that. But innocent people, they've got nothing to do with the situation. Why bring an attack on them? That's our first thing. For social media, because there was, there's a, there was an outright ban on social media at the moment. Outright, complete ban. WhatsApp, all things. And at the moment, some ahwal are probably going wild there, you know, and people unfortunately are, are suffering the brunt of it. Then it's obviously within our capacity, like in my responsibility as being, if you want to call me an imam, a khatib, a mulvi, a sheikh, whatever you want to call me, call me a brother, that's all good as well, alhamdulillah. For us to create awareness and inform our communities that this is what's happening and this is how we should respond. So obviously it's to create awareness in whichever way possible we can. Now and obviously now, being the month of Ramadan, being other months as well, giving zakat, keep in mind those Muslims where we can help them financially. Someone's business got destroyed, now they're applicable for taking zakat. They were giving, now they're taking. Help them financially. Okay, I want my uh, portion, I want my, some of my money to go here. Before I would send it to another place, this time, inshallah, this year I want to give it to this place. Help the Muslims try to rebuild their lives and so on. Also, now, this is now something which our, it can refer to us ourselves. Whatever difficulty, fasad and fitna and difficulty we see is a result of our own doings. We cannot deny this. We cannot deny that our actions have an implication on this ummah. Subhanallah, there, we don't have time to go into the details, but honestly, there are certain a'mal, if done, can withhold and hold the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a'mal have a direct relation on the anger and the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we take those and retract those a'mal, Allah will send his rahmah down. So we are also collectively responsible as an ummah. The first things I mentioned were proactive. Awareness, talking about it, spent giving money, helping financially, helping in terms of aid, you know, physically, all and good. But now there's another spiritual dimension which we have, which non-Muslims won't agree, others won't agree. Even Muslims will be skeptical. And they'll say, the AKH is here. 
What's this? Brother, we believe in spirituality. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he went to face the, the mushrikeen of Makkah, Badr, 313 against 1,000. The Muslims only had 70 camel, two horses, seven swords. One shoe, one foot. The other Sahabi had another, foot, another shoe and another foot. Any person who saw them would think they were going for a suicide mission. They weren't going for war. They would shed tears. They were up against 1,000 people. But when they stood face to face, Allah sent down malaika for their nusrah. So we, we believe in this. We believe in the help and nusrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even at the time when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on Uhud, Muslims lost. Uhud, the following year they had a battle, Muslims lost. And then what happened was Abu Sufyan and party were going back to Makkah. They thought to themselves, we should have... Go, we should go back to Medina and destroy them. So, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam caught on. He heard, he was made aware that there is this going attack now by Abu Sufyan. He's going to come to Medina. This is the Ahwa which has spread. So he said to the Sahaba who attended Uhud the day before, who from you is willing to stand up and protect the Muslims? 200 in total, but 70 from amongst those who, who fought the previous day, who fought. And he mentions who were shadid, very zakhmi, very, uh, heart, very uh, wounded. They even stood up as well. Limping, they said, no, we are ready to go for the cause of Allah to protect the Izzah and honor of Muslims. And they went to a place called Hamra al-Asad, walking by foot, which is eight miles from, from Medina. And they stood there. Abu Sufyan, what happened was, long story cut short, one person who accepted Islam saw the camp on uh, Abu Sufyan on the way and said, Muslims are ready. You know, there's some, uh, if you go back there, you're going you're gonna to get dealt with. So then he got afraid, he got fear, and then he went. The Quran talks about this Surah Al Imran. We don't want to go into the details because time doesn't permit. What I'm saying is, the Prophet wasallam, Sahaba, they were always ready to put themselves forward for mujahada, always ready to put themselves for the sake of the Muslim Ummah. We've become insular, very selfish individuals. Nawazibillah, we have. We have, Nawazibillah. Even ask, ask yourself, mashallah, Allah brought us to a country like this. We have relatives abroad and we see that they are in need. Do we help them financially? Do we assist them? It's all about myself. Let me just build my own enterprise, my own house, my own court here, my own. Brother, help people. Allah gave you, mashallah, a position. Help people, subhanAllah. But one thing as well, and then when the Sahaba, when they heard that Abu Sufyan was going to attack, I finished my point, when he was going to attack, what happened was that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba, they said, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. This is often, if often recited, can remove the difficulties and send down the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muslims should readily read this in times of ahwal, times of difficulty. But I want to mention a few, one or two more things and finish. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a previous prime minister in Pakistan by the name of Benazir Bhutto, right? Benazir Bhutto. And what happened was, is that she got killed, assassinated. On that day, people from the People's Party and other gunde they were ransacking. They would. They, they were. They went on a rampage, breaking hospitals, setting buildings on fire. What? What has the hospital done to you? What has the car done to you? What's the building done to you? Some people were pulled out of their cars, and their cars were burnt. By you, what akalmandi is this? Can you see what Muslims go always? And they in in, in jazba of Benazir Bhutto. But are you thick or something? Are you thick? You're going to pull one guy who's just driving past from A to B to get in his business. You pull him out of his car and set his car on fire. And that's supposed to be justice. That's hukuk. That's, that's izzat. That's zillat, Allahu Akbar. This is what causes the ghadab of Allah to descend. This was a ma'asum individual. So we, are, we also do the same in name of people's party. Bruv, we must be dumb or something, man. We're getting ri we ridiculed around the world and we ridicule ourselves even. These are the things we have to open up our eyes to. And see where it boils down to? My party, my people. I'm defending my people. Allahu Akbar. I am Gujarati, I'm Surti, you're Memon. I'm from Dhaka. We're the Silat guys, you're the Dhaka guys. We're the Punjabi guys, you're the Pathan guys. On a small scale, we do all this. This is the thing we need to break out of. Unity, brothers, unity. Wallah. If you don't understand your brother's fellow language, his language, he's still a Muslim. Salam, give salam to one another. Make salam, aham. Make ukhuwa. If you look at where the Muslims are situated from, all the way from, from Jazair, from, from, from Maghrib, all the way up, look at that whole, every Muslim country is connected. If there was ukhuwa, stability, wallah, there would be strength in the whole ummah. But we don't, we don't have that. Based on a country's border, Allahu Akbar, this country doesn't get along with this one, this one doesn't get along with this one, this speaks another language, their politics are different, internal <laughs> politics, external politics, ex Allahu Akbar, where do we cry, where do we shed tears? This is why I say, brother, it's very important for us to talk of unity and ihtihad. Anywhere where there's ikhtilaf. I, I was watching a video, I, just look at the mindset. When attacks were happening against Muslims, someone was debating, saying, he was doing a video, this, this person's aqeed is not correct, they're like this. Brother, in your country, fire is burning. 
And you're saying he's Wahhabi or he's Sunni. Are you dumb or something? We're arguing, okay, well, someone ties their hands there. No, 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 then we're the Wahhabi. Brother, that's exactly what people take advantage of. This is the thing we need to get out of. If someone ties their hands here, behind their back, stands one hand on the head, that's between him and Allah. It's nothing to do with you. We need to get out of this ghafla and jahala. It's between him and Allah. How does it hurt you? It's this fiqh, this stuff, which has caused so much nuqsan. If someone is clear cut, gone, then you don't support such people. But small issues, we should have a level of tolerance. Time has gone on, we finish here. May Allah give us tawfiq to make amal and practice. Bring ukhuwa, ittihad, and unity amongst ourselves and have, have fikr and gham for the entire ummah. Allah use us for khair, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.